What's up, RLI family? Welcome to our YouTube channel. Wherever you're tuning in from, you are an answer to prayer. It is our hope that you find restoration power in your life, your family, and your household. Let's take a listen.
some praise this morning to the never failing God. This morning as we prepare to take up communion, as we prepare to take our emblems, um, I was thinking on communion and yesterday uh, my daughter Ella has been, or not yesterday, but she's been bugging and bugging my sister to come to church. I have lots of unsaved family members and um, my sister has um, a daughter Ella's age. So Ella was bugging and bugging her and every time my sister says yes. And so um, Ella told me yesterday, mom, did you talk to Nani? Did she, did she say she's coming? And I was like, I'm sorry, baby, she's not gonna come. And she's like, but she always promises me. And I was like, I know, I, I know, I'm so sorry. And so I, I talked to my sister, I'm like, dude, you need to stop promising my kid that you're gonna come. And so anyways, Nick and I took that moment to, to explain to Ella, Ella, you know, sometimes, most of the time, humans are gonna fail us. Humans are gonna make promises they can't keep. And not all the time is it because they want to be mean or their intention is to fail us, but things happen and and so we just have to prepare our hearts that yes, keep inviting her, yes, keep believing that the Lord is gonna save her, but know that sometimes they're gonna say no and, and they're going to break their promise. So we reminded Ella that how many of us know in this place that Jesus will never fail us? And so that's what we told Ella. Humans are gonna fail us, but God will never fail us. And so this morning, as we get ready to take communion, I just want to remind you of a good God that we have. A good God that would go to the cross for us, that would lay down his life for us, and that will never fail us. That we can come to him with any problem we have. We can come to him with anything big or small, and he's always going to see us through. It may not be how we like it, but he's always going to see us through. So this morning, I want to read this scripture to you. It says, John 16, 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take part, I have overcome the world. We get to rest in that this morning, that we have the victory through Jesus, through what he did on the cross for us. So as you prepare to take your emblems, I'm just going to pray. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you that you're a never failing God. We thank you that you're a good father who went to the cross for us, who died for us. We thank you, God, that you love us and that you'll see us through, God, through every situation, Jesus. And we just bless you and we praise your name. In your name we pray, amen. Come on, who's excited to be here this morning? We have a lot of exciting things going on at Restoration Life this morning. But before we get into that, why don't you go ahead Greet your neighbor, greet someone you don't know, and welcome home. Hello. Good morning, church. Feels so good to be here with you this morning. Right now we're gonna be going into a time of giving. I'm sure many of you have heard the phrases or the sayings, it's better to give than to receive, or we are blessed to be a blessing. And these phrases really are so true. And as I'm getting older and older, it's been exciting to take part in this. And so I just wanna share a story of a time when I gave a gift to the Lord. So there was a period of time when I wasn't working for a while. And I remember the time where I received my first tips after what felt like forever of not working. And I remember getting like a, an envelope, a yellow envelope filled with cash. And I received it and I looked at it and I was so excited. It had been forever. I was like, this is awesome. But I was excited because I knew exactly where it was going. I knew exactly that what what would I was going to do with it and I saw the cash and I looked at it and I knew that it was going to be a gift that I was going to give to God 
I, in my heart, I was like, I know that this is something that the Lord had blessed me with, but I was like, Lord, I want to give this to you. Like, I want you to have this. And I just remember being excited to even come to church that Sunday and give it to God. I like, I couldn't wait to give it to him. And I couldn't wait to tell him how much I loved him. There's this uh, verse in Matthew, it's in Matthew 6, 21. And it says, where your heart is, there your treasure is also. So we give to the things that we care about. That's where we spend our money on, the things that are special to us. And so whenever we give to God, we're actually showing him that we love him. So our generosity is one of the ways that we show God that we love him. And I actually, I don't think that we can love without giving, right? Love is something that we do. And so whenever, like it's something we, we don't just say it, but we have to do it, right? Um, and so I also think that God is just the greatest example of generosity. He is so, so generous, right? He gave us the, the best gift, the gift of salvation. And it's a gift that he gave out of love for us. And this morning, we get to give to God. We get to minister to God and show him that we love him through our giving. And so where your heart is, there your treasure is also. And so this morning, let's give to God and let's show him that we love him and that our hearts are with him. Amen. So Lord, we just thank you, Lord, that you have been so generous with us. That you have given us the best gift, Lord. We thank you that you show us that you love us every single day. And so God, this morning... We just want to give to you, God. We want to give you a gift. We want to show you that we love you. So, Lord, I just pray over every person, God, that's going to be giving today. God, I thank you that you don't look at the amount to be impressed, Lord, but that you look at our love. And so, Lord, we just want to release our love through our giving this morning to you, God. And I just pray, Lord, that every person that gives, Lord, that you would just multiply everything that they give, God, that you would supply their every need. And we just honor you, God. We lift you up this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, RL. We're excited to catch you up on all things Restoration Life. But before we do, Brian, will you speak to our new people? I would love to. If you're new to Restoration Life, our VIP team will be waiting for you right outside those doors to pray for you, get you plugged in, and if you're joining us online, click on the connect card in our live chat. Okay, 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 okay. I know I was supposed to wait until later in the announcements, but I literally can't help myself. Restoration Life, we are launching 32 life groups. Valen, what are you doing? We have a script to follow, but anyways, if the baptisms today led you to take a new step in your faith, the next Baptism Sunday is the last Sunday in September. You can go ahead and sign up on our app or website. Our Life Youth Kickbacks are coming back again, right here on campus, Wednesday at 7 p.m. You know, Fallon, as a teenager myself, I know how important it is for my generation to be poured into. So if you're new to RL, I want to encourage you parents to invite your teenagers to come hang, have some snacks, and listen to a message about the Spirit of God moved in the Book of Acts and just have a great time meeting new teens and leaders. Young adults, listen to this special message from our newly ordained assistant pastor, Nick Huerta. Huerta. <laughs> hey, what's up, young adults? Here's what we have coming up for you guys. Every first and third Friday of the month, we're gonna gather for our Friday Night Life service here at Restoration Life. And it's just gonna be an awesome time in the word and prayer and worship and fellowship. And we wanna encourage you guys to be there. And every second and fourth Friday of the month, we're gonna gather in the homes of some of our young adult leaders here at Nightlife. And we encourage you guys, join us next Sunday for our Life Group Expo so you can get to know the team. We hope to see you there. God bless you guys. Join us Saturday, September 3rd, right here from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. for our Saturday morning prayer. Every month, we come together to worship and pray over our city and our church body. Let's be intentional and intercede for God's people. We can't wait to see you there. Family, save the date. On September 11th, we will be having a Life Group Expo out on the blacktop. You'll be able to meet all of our Life Group leaders, see where they're located across the South Bay, and also see what times and days they need. Our heart behind the expo is simple. Go where you grow. Life Groups are essential to our walk here at Restoration Life, because not only are we building relationships, but we also get to learn how community is our blessing. 
but it doesn't stop there. September 12th, guess what? What? Life groups are officially back in motion. You better proclaim that. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Lastly, all children interested in joining our Kids Life worship team, please join them at rehearsals Wednesday, September 7th at 6 p.m. in Kingdom Kids One Room. For more information, reach out to Elizabeth at restoration-life.com. Whew, I know that was a lot of announcements, but it if was. you missed any of them, you can get all caught up on our app or our website. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Restoration Life Church. And stay with us, family. To listen to us on the go, you can head over to YouTube, Spotify, or podcast. We, we hope, hope you enjoyed, enjoyed today's, today's message. message. Come on, somebody make some noise for life groups coming back. Not only are life groups coming back, last year, uh, coming out of the quarantine, coming out of the pandemic, uh, our, our church shrank some bit. And um, so did our life groups. And we had a little over maybe eight life groups, maybe a couple more concerning the women of joy and the men's uh, groups. And... And it, it, it took a big hit on our church um, because community is our blessing. And we believe at Restoration Life and in our community that, that the strength of our church, number one, is our faithful, devoted relationship to Jesus. Um, but it's also found in our faithful, devoted relationship to one another. Right? So the strength of our church is a relationship to God and a relationship to God's people. So the greatest command in the Bible is to love God, love people. So as we love God, we love his people. And so it was hard to navigate that whole season, not being able to connect as much as we'd like to. So I want you to make some noise for 32 life groups being launched today. Come on, today, 32 life groups are being launched. And these couples and these young adults are really a beautiful expression of God taking us from our brokenness to their breakthroughs. And if you were to know all the testimonies in the lives of the people that are leading the life groups this new season, um, you, you couldn't do anything but thank God for his grace and his love and his mercy. Um, so today I'll, I want to present to you all the new life group leaders here at Restoration Life. Um, and, and really just for the sake of time, if you were at that life group leader meeting at my house and we prayed over you, uh, I want you to stand to your feet and I want you to come stand in front, right here in front of this altar for just a moment. If you guys can come in and just face your church um, family because we're going to pray over you. And can we just give them a big round of applause? Just thanking God for them. Just all the life group leaders from side to side. Some of you guys don't know our friends and family, uh, the Posners. Um, but they're back home here at Restoration Life. Uh, they, were, they were on assignment for a number of years. And uh, they came back home. And, and Jesse and Alini are, are tremendous leaders. And, and so uh, I, just in case you don't know, this is Leora's brother and sister-in-law and Carol's son and daughter-in-law. And uh, they were a part of our youth ministry for such a long time, working alongside uh, Max and Teresa when they were youth leaders. And uh, God gave them an assignment in a number of different cities. And so they're back home here in the South Bay. So they're back at Restoration Life. Come on. And we're looking forward to Jesse teaching in ROU and them leading a life group. And he's got a new book out too, right? You got a new book, right? Um, so we're going we're gonna to be promoting some of that. And so um, we just want to thank God uh, for all the life group leaders that were here. There are 32 total. You guys can maybe scoot over just a little bit. Um, and then we're going to do this again, the second service, and we're going to have baptisms in the second service and baby dedications in the second service. So it is a busy, busy day. Um, but church, if you would with me for just a moment, um, every single one of these families are representing a life group, whether it be a men's group, a women's group, a young adults group, or a, uh, um, a family group. And they're opening their homes, they're opening their hearts, uh, and most of all, they're opening their Bibles and their prayer life <laughs> to the will and the presence of God. And so um, we just thank God for you guys. Thank you so much for your yes. Thank you so much um, for responding 
um, to the need at Restoration Life because community is our blessing and we need to be and have people in community together because as our church continues to grow, right, the way that we stay intimate is in small communities. And this is what life groups are. So if you're not a part of a life group, I wanted to present them to you so that you can see their faces. You're going to see them on the website. Next week we're going to have, is it next week? No, in September, we're going to have our life group expo. And uh, the, you're going to be able to meet all of them and hear some of their story and connect with them. And we want you to visit different life groups in this season because midweeks are shut down for now. And so in this new season, you, you're, you're going to have the opportunity to go connect with all these wonderful, wonderful leaders here at Restoration Life and um, just connect with them. Um, just a miracle. Like, like I just see uh, Derek and Anna Gilliam over there. Just a miracle of heaven. Like, I'm not here to, like, cast light on you or, but man, when you talk about God taking somebody from their brokenness to breakthrough, wow, you are restoration life, man. Just every single one of you, really. But um, me, me and Derek go back a ways, and it's so, it's so good to see all these beautiful families um, say yes to God. So could you just stretch your hands forward with me today? Um, we believe in releasing leaders into leadership as a church, not just as the pastoral leadership, but we believe that as a church collaboratively and together as a community, we release people to do what they said yes, God, to do. And so, Father, we thank you for every life that's represented here. We thank you, God, for every life group leader, God, that is going to love your people the way that you have loved them. Um, Father, I pray a special anointing and grace on every home represented here right now. Lord, we know that the enemy is going to try to stop us from loving your people, from restoring your people, from training up your people, from discipling your people, from seeing your people taken from brokenness to breakthrough. But Lord God, I pray for a special grace and a special strength for them to be able to do what you have called them to do for this chapter of life that they're in. And God, we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise in Jesus' name. And the church said, come on, say amen with me. Give the Lord another big shout of praise. Come on. You guys can be seated. Thank you so much. Thank you for your yes. Uh, make sure that you guys look for them afterwards and connect with them. I got two more quick announcements that I want to make um, before we show you this bumper video. Um, We've been in transition in our youth ministry. Our youth ministry is thriving, and uh, they're reaching the teenagers of the South Bay. And uh, we, we're making a small transition. Actually, it's not a small transition. It's a big transition. You know, uh, uh, Aaron and Monica uh, having babies back to back and, and, and everything that comes along with that. Um, they're in a season of rest and and of, and of reconnecting uh, as a family. And so we want to give them that space and that time. And uh, in this season, God has been raising up another uh, youth leader. We'll call him a youth director. Uh, I want you to give the Lord a big hand of praise for Michael as he comes up. Come on. Come on, new Restoration Life youth director. Love you, man. Michael, as you know, has a, an incredible music ministry. Um, and also, he's a, he just started actually working full-time for Young Life, uh, where his responsibility is overseeing a region uh, out here in the uh, South Los Angeles area. And their reach is into every high school campus in that area uh, to reach as many young people as he can with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so... Uh, we thank God for that opportunity. Um, we also thank God that God's been uh, raising him up here at Restoration Life, just a son of the house. Uh, so we want to pray for Michael uh, today as well. Uh, and we have one more incredible announcement for you guys. God's been doing a lot of great things here, raising up new leaders, which is a part of our release, right? Reach, restore, release. So we're releasing Michael as the new uh, Restoration Life Youth Director. And we're also releasing a couple from their life group to have oversight over all the life group leaders and their responsibility is to make sure that all these wonderful people that 
stood in front of you today that, are, that said yes to God uh, and said yes to loving on people. How many know sometimes people are difficult to love? <laughs> Come on. Somebody like, I was that person, right? I was, I was difficult to love, right? Um, but thank God for life group leaders that say yes and are willing to love people in the middle of their ugly, right? Um, and, and exchange the ashes for beauty, right? And so um, we have a couple that uh, we're licensing today as life group directors, very first time here at Restoration Life. Would you give it up for David and Elizabeth Gonzalez as they come up? Come on, somebody make some noise. Yeah. Ese chico. <laughs> Come on. Those of you already know Elizabeth, she's our Children's Church Director here at Restoration Life. An incredible, incredible blessing to us. And why don't you guys stand up here. Don't worry, you won't fall off. That's what the little line is for. It's a horse field right there. Um, but um, David and Elizabeth's task is to keep all the life group leaders healthy, right? To make sure that they're being taken care of, that they're being nourished, um, that they're being prayed over. And, and we do that collectively as a church, um, but we want more direct oversight um, because as a church continues to grow, the network continues to grow, a lot of us get spread out really thin. And David and Elizabeth has probably been one of the most fruitful life groups um, in, our, in our church, we've had to go in there and break them up <laughs> a number of times. Like, I, I got threatened one year by the Ramos and the Gilliams and the Barajas at an after party. They're like, you can't break us up. You can't do that. I was like, watch me. Watch me. And now they're both life group leaders. Now they're both life group leaders. So that's cool. We're still waiting for the Barajas, but we'll get there. Anyways, <laughs> we'll get there. Uh, but this is the family. Right? We're a big family, and I just thank God for the oversight that you're going to bring to our life group leaders. It is a tremendous task and blessing at the same time. So thank you for your yes. Would you stretch your hands forward to these amazing, amazing leaders? Father, thank you so much, Father, uh, for what you're going to do through Michael in the youth ministry and beyond outside of this campus. Lord, you've called them to so much more than just this campus, God. You've called them into the school system of Los Angeles to reach the broken and the messed up, Lord God, to bring them into a place of healing and restoration by the grace and the mercy of your love. I pray, God, for a special anointing on them today. God, that you bless them, that you encourage them, that you strengthen them, God, that you meet every need according to your riches and glory. And Father, thank you for this couple, Lord God. Thank you for this son. Thank you for this daughter. Lord, I pray, Father, right now in Jesus' name that you would bless their home and give them all the energy they need uh, for all the life group leaders and their families. Lord, I pray that you bless them and give them wisdom beyond their years. And we thank you for that today in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. come on. Amen. Come on, church. Make sure to keep them in your prayers. Uh, we got a video that we want to show you, and then I'll be right back with the message. Police officials are discussing a mass shooting that happened. A new Gallup poll shows only 47% of U.S. adults say they belong to a house of worship. A chunk of Americans abandoned their religion. Christianity is on the decline in the U.S. How did we get here? When you open the Bible to the birth of the church in the book of Acts, and you read about the movement that exploded on the day of Pentecost, what you'll see in chapter by chapter is thousands upon thousands who are hearing the gospel and being radically transformed by the power of God. The church was being birthed in unity from house to house with men, women, and children experiencing an incredible move of God unlike anything that culture or our world has ever seen before. Jews and Gentiles, free and enslaved. And one of the things about this move was seeing the strength and the unity of the early church. Now fast forward 2,000 years, you can't help but ask the question, how did we get here? 
How did we get to a place where there are two billion Christians on our planet, but the church is so fragmented? There were so many atrocities committed in the name of Jesus? How does that even make sense? I believe that we've drifted away from who we've been called to be, and we've allowed our hearts and our minds to be corrupted by culture. But I don't think this is how the story ends for the church. I have to believe that there's an awakening that's beginning to happen within the body of believers. We know that as a day draws near for Jesus to return, we'll have to rise up and lead the charge in unifying the body of Christ once again. There will be an intense purging within the church. Paul the Apostle proclaimed that we are God's masterpiece. It's time to come together and edify one another, honor one another above ourselves, and restore one another in grace and truth. It's our time to answer the call. We are the church. Somebody say, I am. I am. Come on, say it like you mean it. Say, I am, I am. the church. We've taught everybody here at Restoration Life that we don't go to church, that we, we are the church. The church isn't made up of brick and mortar and, and lumber and, and all the stuff that you see around us. This, this is all good, you know, for us to experience a collective gathering together. But the reality is, is that we are the church. This is just an empty facility, an empty campus until you get here. This is just a building until you get here. This is where the church meets. This is where the church gathers. And over the last 2,000 years, the church has been attacked. Uh, the church has done some pretty um, malicious things in the name of Jesus. Uh, the church has lost its way. Um, the church has experienced division. The church has... Uh, in today's language created a lot of church hurt um, for other people and that's not the divine design of the church God never intended the church to become necessarily what it is today fragmented and with different doctrines and theologies um, Jesus prayed in the book of John very clearly he said Father I pray that they are one with me as I am one with you, and somewhere along the way, um, human error in leadership caused division and and discord and divisiveness, where uh, the church was fragmented throughout the last two thousand years. And so, how did we get here? Well, I can tell you exactly how we got here: human error. Human error caused the division and the fragmentation of the church, but I'm one of those guys that believes that God has a way of restoring things, that God could take the brokenness of our life and turn it into something beautiful and magnificent. In fact, I would say to you today that you're sitting next to a miracle of God, that you're sitting next to someone that might have been or maybe is in their brokenness, and yet God didn't design us or create us to live in brokenness, but rather to live in his breakthrough. And I really believe that in this series that God is gonna give many of us these breakthrough moments that take us from glory to glory to glory. Because we're always growing, we're always changing, we're always becoming another version of ourselves. For me, 32 years ago, there was a broken drug addict, alcoholic, knucklehead kid that was broken by a broken family and entered into the majesty of his presence and one moment in his presence changed everything for the rest of my life. And I believe if God can do that for me, God can do that for you. That if God can heal me, God can heal you. I mean, he took me from addiction and in the blink of an eye and in one moment removed all addiction from my life. That's a miracle of heaven. And so I'm just one of those guys that believes that God can take anyone. No one in this room is too far broken or messed up that God can't restore you, that God can't heal you. In fact, I really believe that somebody here this morning 
is in line or in position to receive a breakthrough moment today in Jesus' name. And so if you're new to Restoration Life, we want to welcome you. If you're watching us online, whether you're in Cali or, or far off, we, we want to welcome you. Is there anybody new here this morning? Any, any, anybody new here? Maybe your first time here? Yeah, just welcome. Honored to have you with us. I, I can't really see you out there that good, but I just want to welcome you. If it's your first time here, I want to welcome you to Restoration Life. Believe it or not, we love you already. And you might ask, well, how can you say that? Well, because he first loved us. And so today we continue this new series entitled Mosaic, where God rescues us from our brokenness and brings us into our breakthrough, transforming us into his masterpiece. And if you're new to Christianity or in transition here to a new church, I believe this series can help all of us live out what God has planned for us, not just as individuals, but collectively as what the Bible would describe as the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, or the temple of the Most High God. That, those are the three um, illustrations that, that the Word of God uses to describe the church, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, and the temple of the Most High God. But he's not talking about materialistic things. He's talking about his creation, you and I. And so I pray that this series not only blesses you, but it also gives you a refreshed revelation of who we've been united to be as the church that Jesus built and he is still building today. And so with that being said, I've entitled this message this morning, God's Masterpiece, because I want to encourage you today. I want you to be encouraged by the word of God today. I want you to see yourself through the eyes of heaven. I want you to see yourself through the lens of heaven or through the lens of scripture because today there are so many things that are keeping us from seeing us ourselves the way that God sees us. And, and one, of the, one of the reasons why that is is because we've, the, the, the new assault on humanity has been the assault of comparison. Right? How do you compare to somebody else? How does your marriage compare to somebody else's marriage? How does your spouse compare to somebody else's spouse? How does your business compare to somebody else's business? How does your, your Instagram or your TikTok profile, for some of you a little bit older, your Facebook <laughs> profile, compare to other people's profile when in fact all we see is everybody's highlight reels? Like, I wish everybody would really show what they look like in the morning and not use any filters. Right? I, I wish people would be honest and say, I'm struggling today, I'm battling today, I'm hurting today. Would you pray for me as, as opposed to living my best life all the time? But you might be living your best life because you're in Christ. And there's nothing wrong with that either. And so today I want, I want you to look at Scripture through the perspective of heaven and I want you to look at how God sees you and why God sees you and I as his masterpiece. You know, there have been a lot of incredible artists in our lifetime. And although most artists create many different kinds of works, it seems like for the most of them that they come to be identified primarily by one particular work or piece of art. I don't know if there's any art aficionados in this room right now or aficionados in this room um, I actually like artwork. I'm not, I'm not like the greatest at understanding all the dynamics at art or pieces, but I, I, can, I can appreciate um, works of art. Um, for me, works of art might look a little bit different than they might for you. Like being a, a former mechanic and technician, like I love when things work together. Like to me, a transmission is a work of art. The way that it works it, it actually works like, like a human body. It's, you know, the oil, it's like it's, it's blood, and, and, the, and the valve body, it's like it's, it's brain, and, and, and the pump, it's like it's heart, and the gear train, it's like it's, it's arms and it's legs. And so um, when I was working on transmissions as, as a head tech, um, I loved just the design of it. I, I love the way that, that watches are designed. Anybody with me? Any men with me? I love the way that they work together and the intricacy of those 
of those small, tiny moving parts. And my, 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 my uncles and my grandfather, they were jewelers. And so um, I, I'd get to see them with their little, you know, eyepieces on fixing these tiny works of art. And I would just be blown away by the mechanisms that, that were in this. But other people see other things as very artistic, like this first one, if you could put it up. See if anybody can um, tell me what, what painting this is. If Maybe you guys could put this first painting up. Does anybody... It's your tia, Concha, what? It's, it's Mona Lisa, right? Does anybody know who created this artwork? Leonardo DiCap uh, Da Vinci. <laughs> what, what about this next one? Um, see if anybody recognizes this next one. Starry Night. Who, who, who painted it? Van Gogh did. How about this one? This is a different kind of art piece. It's The Thinker, The Thinker by Rodin. Here's another one that many of you will, will know. <laughs> the creation of Adam. Now, I didn't want to show the whole picture um, because Adam's naked. <laughs> and I didn't want to get blasted on social media for putting up a naked art piece up there. So the creation of Adam in the Sistine Chapel, who created that? One of the Ninja Turtles, Michelangelo, right? It's plain. Here, here's another one. Here's another one. You guys will know this. The Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci. And for each of these artists, the works we just look at would definitely be referred to at least as one of their masterpieces. Like this is what they went down in history for being remembered for. Now, of course, we've got other masterpieces in music like Bach and, and Beethoven and Mozart. Um, but for each of these artists, the works we just looked at would definitely be referred to as one of their great masterpieces. So the question that I have for you is, well, what is God's masterpiece? I mean, if God created the heavens and the earth and he put all the stars in place and he has and he's named them, like, what is God's masterpiece? Like, one of the things that I, I, I look at as, as God's masterpiece is the ocean. I love the ocean. I, I think it's gorgeous. There's something about the ocean that I could, I could go to the shore, I could sit there, and it just calms me. Uh, but one of the things I love doing is playing in the ocean. When I was younger, I loved to surf. Um, when I got a little bit older, I started diving with my kids and um, some of the friends here at Restoration Life. And I, underneath, it's like a whole other world. It's like Avatar, it's, it's crazy, it's incredible. Um, or how about the Grand Canyon? Would that be considered God's masterpiece? I mean, it's certainly beautiful. Um, what about um, Mount Everest or Niagara Falls? Like one of the things that I love to do when we go camping is I love at night to stare up into the heavens. In fact, Psalms 91.1 says this, the heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. You may not know this, but a number of us were able to go see the James Webb Telescope a couple of times before they packed it and they launched it uh, right here out of Redondo Beach. It, it, was, it was put together right here um, at Northrop Grumman and they launched it and um, they sent it a million miles away. And it took some of the most incredible pictures. Can you guys put up some of those pictures? Like, just incredible pictures. And, and, and I don't even think these screens do these pictures that much justice. But you can see, like, the, the universe is still expanding. It's still growing. And um, God loves a great light show. Let me just say that. Uh, he's the father of lights. But when you look at, like, this is more than a million miles away, and we have the technology to capture these images. Hold that for just a second, because when you, when you get a more detailed look at all these major star systems, you'll find out that every massive star represents like a galaxy in that area. Like our galaxy, the Milky Way, right? It's just one galaxy amongst billions of galaxy, and yet God knows them by name, and the Bible declares that He can hold it in the palm of His hand. 
But I would ask you the same question. Like, if I were to look out at the heavens, I would go, this is God's masterpiece. Creating galaxies and universes and auroras and black holes and all these, these things that I love to look at, I love to watch. But the Bible doesn't declare that it is his masterpiece. In fact, the psalmist also reveals something dynamic about you and I. Psalms 139, 14, it says this. The psalmist writes, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. Do you know that the Bible is very clear that there's nothing on planet Earth like you and I? In fact, geneticists would say that we are 99% alike as human beings. But there's a small variation. Even identical twins have a very small variation between them that happens in their cells, in their DNA. Did you know that our bodies contain 75 trillion cells, each made up of 50 billion atoms? We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Do you know that every four to five seconds, 50,000 of my cells die and are replaced by 50,000 new cells? So while you're listening to this message, your body is producing somewhere between 15 and 25 million new cells, depending on how long I preach today. <laughs> Did you know that they believe that inside of your body, that there are anywhere between 75,000 miles to 100,000 miles of arteries, veins, capillaries, enough to circle the earth three times. And you carry around that with you every single day of your life. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Do you know? Here's a gross, this is a gross thing that I found out. That throughout your lifetime, you produce 25,000 gallons of saliva. Enough to fill two swimming pools. Imagine taking a dive into that. So I, I think that we could all agree that you and I are fearfully and wonderfully made. Do you know that the way that God designed the body, he designed it to heal itself and to expel? You and I carry a trillion bacteria within us and our body is at constant war with bacteria that is bad for us. You carry bacteria that's good for you, but you also ca carry bacteria that's bad for you. Um, I, I found this, this out today, this morning as I was studying this mess, I was just looking at the human body a little bit more. Do you know that you can't um, swallow and breathe at the same time? Like try it right now. You can't do it, it's impossible. It's like keeping your eyes open when you sneeze. It's impossible. There's certain things that you can and cannot do. Right now you're going, I can't do it. No, you can't. Stop trying to. God's creation, the heavens and the earth, and our human bodies all reveal the glory of God. And yet, the Bible doesn't declare that any of them are God's masterpiece. Let's read our text this morning because I want to bring this I want to bring this, um, bring this down to you. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Max read this last, last week. I'll read it again this week. The Bible says, for we are God's what? His what? His workmanship. Right? We are, well, that version says handiwork. My version says workmanship. Another translation would say masterpiece. But for the sake of, of, of time, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do what? Which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, in the ESV translation, which is the most common translation that, that translates from the Greek or the Hebrew to English, 
The word workmanship or handiwork in this verse is the Greek word poimea, which is the same word that we get our English word poem from. The word means so much more than poem. It is a word that indicates God's workmanship transitioning into God's masterpiece. In Ephesians 2, 10, out of the New Living Translation, it says it this way, for we are God's masterpiece, and he has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. So here's the first point that I want to make to you today. A masterpiece is the work of the creator and not of the creation. A masterpiece is the work of the creator and not of the creation. There are several characteristics of a masterpiece that are evident in Paul's description of how God prepared you and I to become what we would declare and what God would declare as his masterpiece. Now recognize that I didn't say the way that he formed our physical body, the way that he formed the heavens or the earth. None of those meet the standard of being God's masterpiece. Remember with me that every masterpiece is completely the work of its creator. No one of the art pieces that we saw created this morning um, themselves participated in its creation in any way. It is the artist that does all the work from the formulation of the concept to the planning to the actual creation of the artwork. The same is true when it talks about you and I. It is God that chose us before the creation of the world to be his masterpiece. Now, many of you would say, well, I chose God. But the reality is, God chose you. In fact, the word is very clear in portion of scripture where God says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. There is no way that you could even come to me unless you were convicted of your sin, to repent of your sin, and to come to me so that I can redeem you from your sin and transform you from the darkness that you were living in to the marvelous light that I want for your future. So God is very clear that he chose us before the foundation of the world. In fact, it was God who created the plan to redeem us from the brokenness of our sin, from the brokenness of our addiction, from the brokenness of our, our past, so that he can give us a wonderful new life. In Ephesians chapter one, verse three through six, the Bible says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he did what? Is it up there? For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight in love. Now, we were created to worship him. We were created to love him. We were created to be in relationship with them. But because of our sinful nature, we separated ourselves from all of that and fulfilled our own desire. And it was in that desire that we found ourselves in sin. And if we found ourselves in sin, we found ourselves separated from the Father. But the Father didn't want us to be separated from him for all eternity. eternity. So what does he do? He gives us his best. He gives us his son to redeem us, to restore us, to transform us, and to take us from brokenness to breakthrough. Can somebody say amen and thank God for that today? For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be homely and blameless in his sight, in love. Watch this. He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one that he loves. And so it is God who has done all the work necessary to transform us from our brokenness 
into our breakthrough that makes us into his masterpiece. Listen. Well, don't I have a part to play in this? Well, to some degree, you do. But the work happens in Christ. Outside of Christ, the work does not happen. And so you may have momentary glimpses of victory, momentary glimpses of breakthrough, momentary glimpses of freedom, but it's only in Christ Jesus that you can be free and free indeed. The Bible is very clear. Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly. Jesus came to set the captives free, of which we were all at one point or another. But all we had to do is accept the free gift of his love and of salvation and declare Jesus Christ as Lord, and then all the work happens in Christ Jesus. Can somebody say amen? Jesus said in John 15, 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to bear fruit. Paul emphasizes again in Ephesians chapter two, verse eight and nine. Here's the Bible, right? Let it preach. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this has nothing to do with you. That's what he's saying. You couldn't, you couldn't save yourself. You couldn't rescue yourself. That's why God sent a savior. So he says that it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. It is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that anyone can boast. Then Paul writes that we were created in Christ Jesus. He uses a verb in the Greek that literally means something new that has never existed before. Something new that has never existed before. I want you to hear this. Somebody needs to hear this this morning. You might be watching online. You need to hear this. There is another version of you that God is waiting for you to step into. But you will never step into the other version of who he created you to be until you let go of who you used to be. And the only way to let go of who you used to be is take your hands off the steering wheel. Take your hands off the reins of your life. Now that might sound reckless, but when you surrender your heart and your mind and your life to Jesus, the word of God says that he will make your path straight, that he's a guide, right? That the word of God is a lamp unto my feet, a guide for my path. And that when I give my heart to Jesus, that's why the proverb says to guard your hearts above all else. Why? Because it determines the future of your life. So when you surrender your heart to God and his love for you, what you'll find is you don't even have to work hard to transition out of who you used to be to who he created you to be because it's a miracle that takes place in Christ alone. When you do it on your own strength, on your own ability, it'll be frustrating, it'll be reckless, it'll be hurtful, it'll be painful, but when you surrender to God and you say, God, here I am, I've managed my life up until now, I give you all the reins, I give you the steering wheel, I give you my heart, I give you my life, you lead. God says, okay, deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow me and watch me transform you, not into the person you used to be, but into a new creation. All things are passed away. All things become brand new. It's a miracle of heaven. And I'm here to tell you that I experienced that at an altar. I experienced that as a 19-year-old who was messed up and broken and addicted. I heard the gospel for the very first time in my life, I said, God, if you can honestly change my life, sign me up. And it was in a moment of repentance and salvation that my life was transformed from who I used to be 
into God, into the person God was preparing me to be. So when Paul writes that we were created in Christ, he uses a verb that literally means that you're going to become something that you've never been before. In other words, when God makes us into his masterpiece, he doesn't just change us. He doesn't just clean us up. He doesn't just change our behaviors and shortcomings. He doesn't just cause healing for the sake of new startups. He doesn't just wipe away our tears and our slates clean only to mess up over and over and over and over again. He doesn't just restore by society's definition some existing work of art. He creates us as a completely new masterpiece. And Paul makes this point even more directly in his second letter to the church in Corinth, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he says, therefore, if anyone, say anyone. anyone. Look at somebody and tell them, that means you. That means you. With all your baggage, with all your pain, with all your brokenness, with all your stuff, with all the ugly that's in your life, with all the good that's in your life, with all the blessing that's in your life, he says this, therefore, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, he or she is a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. So a masterpiece is the work of the creator and not of the creation. Secondly, a masterpiece, and this is going to help some of you because you're like, man, I want that. I want that transformation. I want that freedom. I want that healing. And, and, and do you know that you can live in that for the rest of your life? Like, like, I know that we all struggle with stuff. I know that we all battle with things. I know that we all deal with shortcomings and situations that are harmful. Listen, I'm, I'll be the first one to raise my hand to let you know that I'm not perfect, you could ask Roxanne, she could probably, you know, tell you all of my shortcomings, all of my faults, all of my failures. Very short list, but nonetheless a list. <laughs> but I'm still a human being, being that, that feels, that battles, that is tempted, that processes things, right? So we, we can all fit into that, in, in, into that basket, but the reality is a new creation a new creation isn't going to keep falling into addiction because they're new. They're not addicted anymore. They're not broken anymore. They've been made brand new. Like a new creation is going to, isn't going to fall back into um, former relationships that are ungodly relationships because they're new. They're different. They think different. Their heart's different. Their mind's different. Their life's different. They're not going to keep going back to who they once were. That person is dead, right? Unless you like the walking dead. You're like resurrecting the old you. Because sometimes when somebody gets on your last nerve, some of you resurrect your all you. Right? It's like, Pastor, it only takes 30 seconds for me to backslide. I'm like, you need more Jesus in you. That's what you need. But here's what I want you to hear. A masterpiece takes time and process to create. So a lot of times when we go to church, we give our lives to Christ, we surrender our hearts and our thought process to living in accordance or alignment with scripture, it blesses us and it benefits us, but then when we mess up, we're hard on ourselves because we think that we should be perfect and we'll never be perfect, but we are being perfected, right? But we'll never be perfect until we're in heaven with God. So none of us are perfect, no matter what you think, no matter what, what your mom told you, you are not perfect. No matter what teacher told you, well, you're perfect. No, you're not. None of us are perfect. Heavy revy right now, right? Wow, I'm not perfect. Husband's going, see, honey, you're not perfect. I told you. <laughs> told you every day of your life. Stop acting like you're perfect. Not perfect. None of us are perfect, but we are being perfected. What does that mean? It means that we're all in process. Somebody say process. The creation of a masterpiece is usually not the result of some brief haphazard effort. Did you know that the Mona Lisa required four years for da Vinci to complete? Four years for one painting. In fact, x-rays have shown that there are three previous versions of the painting under the one that we're familiar with. Michelangelo took four years to paint the scenes on the ceiling 
of the Sistine Chapel. Rodin made his first plaster cast of the thinker in 1880, but wasn't, it wasn't until 1902, 22 years later, that he completed the bronze cast. In the same way, you and I as believers, we don't become God's masterpiece overnight. We are in process, right? Paul writes that we were created past tense, but we are present tense, God's masterpiece. And here's the crazy thing about when you look at the present tense in the Greek. In the Greek, present tense actually indicates a continual action. A living, breathing masterpiece that's constantly getting better and better. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 through 17, this is the way that he writes it to the church. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away. Does anybody feel like that? Outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. So physically we might be wasting away, but spiritually we're being renewed day by day. It is a process. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Listen, as all of us are painfully aware, none of us immediately become everything that God intends for us to be the moment he enters into our lives and makes us a new creation. I've been serving God for 32 years, and I honestly don't believe that I have become everything that God wants me to be before he calls me home. And I believe that I am a work in progress. I believe, I have this saying, one day we're gonna make the t-shirt, under construction, like being remodeled, <laughs> right? Like a skillful, skillful, skillful artist, God allows us to go through a process. And sometimes the process is painful so that he can mold us and make us into what he created us to be. Like a skillful artist, God sometimes completes us with a master stroke of his brush, and at other times, he chisels away at our lives to get rid of those things that would detract from the beauty of his masterpiece that he's creating in each and every single one of you. Once again, Paul writes into another church um, in Philippi, in Philippians chapter one, verse six, he says this, he who begun a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Look at somebody right now sitting next to you and tell them, he who, who, he who begun a good work in you, Go ahead. he's gonna finish if you let him. We have to let God finish what he started in us. So masterpiece is the work of the creator and not the creation. A masterpiece takes time and process. And thirdly, God's masterpieces are created only, listen to this, in Christ Jesus. What transforms us from brokenness to masterpiece isn't anything that we do, isn't anything that we know, isn't anywhere we work, isn't the amount of money we have or the toys that we accumulate or the properties that we own or the businesses that we run. It isn't any of those things. It's not found in our careers. It's not even found in good works. Nothing on this planet can take us from brokenness to breakthrough except salvation. Salvation is the only thing that can transform our lives and take us from being in our brokenness into God's breakthrough, and collectively we become God's masterpiece. God's masterpieces are created in Christ Jesus. Over the years, artists have used all kinds of materials to create their masterpieces. The Mona Lisa was painted on poplar wood. One of Michelangelo's assistants had to develop a special kind of mold-resistant plaster for the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel that became the base for Michelangelo's paintings there. 
Rodin cast the thinker from a material called bronze. But when it comes to God mas God's masterpieces, he only uses one means of creating them, his son, Jesus Christ. It's the only means by which God creates a masterpiece. If you study Paul's letter, you will find and see how many times Paul uses the term in Christ or in Jesus or equivalent to that. Watch this, Ephesians chapter one, verse three through six. You, you'll, you'll see it now that I've said it. Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. Where? In Christ. So the spiritual blessing happens outside of Christ? No, it only happens in Christ. For he chose us where? In him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in whose sight? In his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through who? Jesus Christ. In accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one that he loves. So the transformation which brings about the masterpiece only happens when you and I are in Christ, when we're in Jesus, when we're walking with Jesus and Jesus is moving through us. Ephesians 1, 9 says, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ. It's all in Jesus, Ephesians 1.11. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received what? An inheritance from God, for he chose us in advance, and he makes everything work out according to his plan. Listen, the only way you and I will experience a breakthrough from our brokenness is to be in Christ. There is no other way. There is no other way. Any other way will give you a, a false measure of breakthrough. But in Christ, you are free indeed. You have been made brand new. You are a new creation. And God even says, all these things work together for your good, for your good, for those who are called according to his purpose. So all things don't work together for our good when we're not in Christ. They only work together for our good when we are in Christ. Somebody say amen. Somebody learning something today. Paul wants to leave no doubt exactly who or what compromises God's masterpiece. You guys can start playing, I'm almost done. As magnificent as the Grand Canyon is, as magnificent as the Niagara Falls are, as Mount Everest and the rest of nature may be, they are not God's masterpieces. As immense and as awesome as the heavens are, they are not God's masterpieces. Even as intricately and wonderfully made as a human body is, even that is not God's masterpiece. Here's where I wanna land this morning. God's masterpiece, you and I, are the people who have accepted the gift of God through faith in Jesus and who have been created anew through means of his death, burial, and his resurrection. So when we accept Jesus as Savior, he makes all things new. Do you know that in Christ, the Bible declares that no weapon formed against you shall prosper? That in Christ, man has nothing on you. Man can't give you anything or take anything away that God gives you. That in Christ, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. You've been fearfully and wonderfully made. You've been predestined. And I don't know how broken your life is. I don't know how broken your hearts are. I don't know how broken your marriages are. I don't know how broken your families are. 
I don't know how broken your career is. I don't know how broken your finances are. I don't know how broken your emotions are. I don't know how broken your mental strength is. But I do know that God has a way of taking you in your brokenness and in your darkness and setting you free from your past and making you a new creation in Christ Jesus where we put on the mind of Christ to help us process everything through his truth and his living word that we put on the heart of Christ where we have a love for God and a love for his creation where we live in accordance and alignment to his wisdom and his purpose because he has planned things for us to do long before we were his masterpiece. If we are to manifest the beauty of what God has created and to be his masterpiece, if we're going to allow it to shine through our speech and our behaviors and our relationships, then we need to understand that the beauty of who we are is not in the outward appearance, but in the simplicity of surrendering to the love of the one who loved us first and wasn't willing that any of us would perish in our mess. But God could turn your mess into a beautiful message. He could exchange beauty for ashes. He could take you out of being a victim to live in victoriously. And every test that you go through, he'll turn it into a testimony. Because God is good. And you, and you, and you, and you, you're his masterpiece. Don't let anybody ever tell you any different. Don't let any social media profile or influencer or teacher or coworker or boss or anybody tell you that you're not worth anything. God saw your worth when he gave his best on a cross 2,000 years ago to redeem you back to himself. If I could just have every head bowed and every eye closed in reverence to the Holy Spirit this morning, I just want to ask you, are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Are you done trying to live up to the lies of this world and the comparisons of this social structure that we live in and fight in every single day of our lives? Are you tired of growing weary of saying, I'm gonna change, I'm gonna change, I'm gonna change, only to always revert back to the very thing that's held you captive emotionally, psychologically, maybe even toxically? Do you wanna be free today? Do you wanna be free from your past? Do you wanna be free from your pain? Do you want to be free from that struggle? I'm not here to promise you that it happens overnight, but I am here to tell you that God could take you right now in your brokenness and transform you into his masterpiece. But it's only found in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Every head bowed, nobody looking around, nobody talking. You say, Pastor, that's me. Raise your hand quickly, 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 so that we can pray. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right now, pray this with me. Say, Jesus. Forgive me of all my sin. I repent. I turn away from my past. I turn away from my brokenness. I turn away from my pain. And in this moment, I believe that you are a miracle maker. I pray that you save me, that you restore me, that you make me into your masterpiece. Right now with your hands lifted high, let me pray for you. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for every heart, every mind, every life that's in this place. I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, that you would strengthen and bring grace and mercy to those that are in need this morning. And I pray, God, that you would move mightily in this moment, right where they're at. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. And the church said, Amen. Would you stand to your feet? Come on, we're going to sing a song.
and just worship God. Let's go. Watch your triumph unfold. He's never failing. He's never failing. Take courage. Take courage, my heart. And stay steadfast, my soul. He's in the waiting. He's in the waiting. And hold on to your hope. Watch your triumph unfold. He's never failing. He's never failing. Church, lift your voice, sing it out. Somebody make a joyful noise this morning. Come on, somebody say this with me. I am God's masterpiece. Come on, say it one more time. I am God's masterpiece. So when you wake up tomorrow morning and the devil's waiting for you, remind them that you are God's masterpiece. Oh, you're a failure. No, 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 no. You don't understand, devil. I'm God's masterpiece. Oh, no, no, you're going to have a bad week. No, 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 no. No, I've given this week already to the Lord. I'm God's masterpiece. And I know that all things work together for my good. Come on. Right? Can you give God another big shout of praise? We love you guys. Restoration Life, we'll see you next week. Thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to hit the like button, share, and subscribe. God bless.